Dear Moses, I write you today with monumental news. Forgive me if it's not in my own hand, but my gout's been acting up again. Yesterday, November 30th, we signed a preliminary peace treaty with Great Britain. John Adams, John Jay, Henry Lawrence, and yours truly signed the document at the Grand Hotel Muscovite in Paris. For some reason, the King's emissary, Richard Oswald, didn't seem nearly as pleased as we were. Liberty is ours, though one troubling question remains. We've won our war, but can our new nation survive in peace? Dr. Franklin, forgive me for interrupting, but I'm in an absolute state. The British ministers refuse to let me paint them signing the peace treaty. I won't be able to finish. Look at it this way, Mr. West. You must abandon a painting. The British must abandon a country. Dr. Franklin, your legs! They're still strong enough to kick King George across an ocean. Manners? Wait for me. Sorry. It just smells so good. I wish Dr. Franklin were here to enjoy this with us. Me too. Can you pass the beans? And Moses as well. Oui. And he sure likes turkey. Could I have a drumstick? And James. It's been forever since we've seen him. Nobody can eat like James. Uh, you going to have some of those yams? Sarah, Henri, working on a story. General Washington, Army, Congress, you have to come with me. Oh, I'm sorry. You're eating. Forget eating? This sounds exciting. Besides, we hadn't really started yet, had we, Henri? Uh, uh, no. So what's this about a story? It can wait. I haven't eaten all day. But we haven't seen you in months. And you can't just leave us hanging. Yeah, we are journalists too. Okay, okay. What if I told you General Washington could have had the chance to become King of America? If he had become a king, then I am the Prince of France. I don't understand. Didn't he fight to get rid of a king? I'd better start at the beginning. Remember how I went to visit General Washington and the Continental Army? The British Army still occupied New York City, but news had come from France that the war was all but over. It's not right! We've got to do something! We're being cheated! It was Major General Horatio Gates and some of General Washington's highest ranking officers. I thought I'd go over and say hello. Gentlemen, Congress has lied to us long enough. Think of all we've sacrificed to win this war. And now that freedom is in our grasp, what has Congress done? It's broken every promise it's ever made, that's what. Has any man here been paid so much as a farthing by Congress? I fought six years and not a penny. Congress promised us all pay. Then it promised us a pension for life. Now it wants to discharge us without giving us either. Okay. Did we serve our country just to lose our property and end up in debtor's jail? We must demand our rights. 
If Congress refuses, I say we march down to Philadelphia and answer them with muskets. Where does His Excellency stand on the matter? Where does Washington stand? He cannot speak publicly on the matter, but I assure you, we have his support. Why else would he allow us to meet tomorrow? Read this, circulate it to bring more men to our cause, then meet at the new building tomorrow at noon. The time has come to take matters into our own hands. If you have sense enough to discover and spirit to oppose tyranny, whatever garb it may assume, awake to your situation. If the present moment be lost, your threats hereafter will be empty. What they were talking about sounds like armed rebellion. It's, it's mutiny. This is the second such letter to be circulated amongst my officers. I ordered them to postpone their meeting, hoping they would reconsider. Obviously, they have not. If you ask me, they're no better than traitors. On the contrary, James. I consider them heroes and patriots of the highest order. They risked their lives to fight for a new form of government. And now they feel that government's turned its back on them. But what they've said about Congress... Comes from honest frustration. They haven't been paid, and there's little chance they will be. But why? The National Treasury has no money. Congress has no power to raise taxes. And the states can't pay what they promised to. The simple truth is that without a strong central government, our republic cannot survive. I heard one of the officers say that you would support an armed uprising on Congress. Is that true? There's something I'd like you to see. This was sent to me by one of my officers not very long ago. He's asking you to become King of the United States. He's saying the army would stand behind you. Have you ever heard of Caesar? Um, that's the name of Dr. Franklin's horse. Julius Caesar was a great general and the most popular man in Rome. After winning a war, he marched his army into Rome... And made himself king? And made himself king. I don't believe it! George Washington would never declare himself king! Never! Would he? Of course not. Anyone with half a brain knows George Washington would never do a thing like that. You'd never declare yourself king, would you? No, James, the very idea is abhorrent to me. To say nothing of the fact that neither the American people nor the vast majority of soldiers would stand for it. The army exists to serve Congress, not the other way around. I thought everything would be fine once the war was over. Now it seems like things are worse than ever. Without justice, the army is a powder keg ready to explode. And right now, I have no idea how to prevent it. James Madison, delegate from Virginia, now has the floor. Gentlemen of Congress, we have no power to act. We have failed to live up to our promises. Now, General Washington warns of an armed uprising against us. No, armed uprising? Outrageous! Who are these men? This must not stand! The army shall not rule! If we do not find some means to pay these honorable men, God only knows what will happen next. I do. All these politicians tell me what's fair now. Congress. 
Washington, the officers at the meeting hall. I've been composing my speech. It will be the most important one I'll ever make. I only hope it doesn't fall on deaf ears. I'd be willing to listen, if you'd like to rehearse it. Hmm, perhaps that's not a bad idea. You wear glasses? Sir? I've kept it a secret. It's not something a commanding officer wants his men to see, unless... I've got to get over to the new building. But what about rehearsing your speech? I just realized that what I say is far less important than how I say it. Gentlemen, we are gathered here today to make a decision. Shall we stand down and receive nothing for our efforts, or shall we rise up and force Congress to give us satisfaction? With your permission, General, I would like to address the officers. Oh, we'd be honored, Your Excellency. Gentlemen, I am well aware of your concerns and have written to Congress requesting a fair settlement. I ask you to be patient. Why should we? We've waited long enough. Shh! Let him speak! I also ask you to remember all we've been through together. The hardships at Valley Forge. Our victories at Trenton and Princeton. Yorktown. Think of our brothers in arms who sacrificed their lives for liberty. Do you really want to turn your backs on them? Make no mistake. I'm proud of each of you. And because I am, I'll do everything in my power to prevent you from disgracing your previous glory. One moment. Gentlemen, will you permit me to put on my spectacles? I don't believe it. I had no idea. His Excellency wears eyeglasses? I have grown gray in your service, and now I'm growing blind. stopped a rebellion just by putting on his eyeglasses? They had sacrificed a lot for their country. But when they saw how much Washington had sacrificed for them... What happened to their rebellion against Congress? It ended right there. Washington walked out, and the officers voted unanimously to reject any acts of violence. In fact, they agreed to let Washington work out a fair payment for them from Congress. Did he? Full pay for five years. It sounds like they would have followed him to the ends of the earth. They didn't have to go that far. King George gave his blessing to the peace treaty, and General Sir Guy Carleton and the British Army evacuated New York City once and for all. The Americans want their own country so badly. Well, they can have it. Julius Caesar made himself a dictator. 
But you know what George Washington did? He invited all his officers to Francis Tavern and said goodbye. I have looked upon each and every one of you as a member of my family. And I wish that your future days will be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. Yeah! You know what I'm going to put in my story? Washington was strong in war, but even stronger in peace. Were you really there at the tavern? This is the mug General Washington used to toast his men. I told Mr. Francis, the tavern keeper, that I wanted to give it to Dr. Franklin. Hmm. I declare that no one will ever be allowed to wash this mug. What did General Washington do after saying goodbye to his officers? I almost forgot. That's what I came here to tell you. He's gone to Maryland to address Congress. We may still be able to get there in time to see for ourselves. That is, if you're interested. I wouldn't miss it for the world! Gentlemen of Congress, I've come here today to thank you for your faith in me and to surrender to your hands the trust you placed in me. When I accepted my commission, I was afraid I wouldn't be able to live up to your expectations. But I gained confidence from knowing that our cause was just. If I may, I'd like to speak of the debt I owe to the army and in particular to the members of my staff. A better group of men does not exist anywhere. I am fortunate to have served with each and every one of them. <clears throat> Gentlemen, it is with a heavy heart that I offer back my commission. My work is done, and now I look forward to retiring from the great theater of action. I came in here a general. I shall leave a private citizen. Washington, sir? Um, can I still call you that? I don't see why not, James. Where are you going now? Oh, I have a farm that needs tending to. really over! It's over! Huzzah! It's over! that the American General Washington has resigned his commission and returned to private life. Come here. The country could have been his for the taking. 
I believe it to be true, Your Majesty. He's returned to the life of a farmer. If it is true, then George Washington is the greatest man alive. Does it look all right, sir? The dove of peace, exactly as I saw it in my dream. If anybody needs me, I'll be surveying the orchards. Yeah. I can scarcely believe the war's been over for nearly three years. But peace has not come easily for all. I'm on my way to New York now, where I will report on the conditions of the Loyalists, those people who remained faithful to England during the Revolution. To do so, I will renew my acquaintance with your friend, Mrs. Radcliffe. She was such a kind hostess to James and me, nearly ten years ago, back in 76. To think how very much has changed since then. It is indeed a most entrancing work. You must give King Louis my deepest thanks for the privilege of entering his private gallery. Congress grants me permission to return to the United States. After all these years, I'm going home. I can barely begin to imagine what awaits me there. What's become of the average continental soldier? The merchant who left his shop? The farmer who left his field? The brave men who marched away from everything they held dear to fight with George Washington for their country and have survived to taste the fruits of their courage. What better place to learn what's happened to the soldiers after the war than in Massachusetts, the cradle of our revolution? So, James, you want to know what it's like for us Continental soldiers now that we've come home? Yes, Captain Chase. Well, come on. I'll show you. Where are we going? To court. Court? Monsieur le Marquis. It is such a pleasure to embrace a good friend in a free United States. Forgive me. I look forward to the day all in this country will be free. You've still had no word from your brother? For two years I searched for him. The closest I got was finding this in Richmond, Virginia. It's from his owner. 
If you see him, please return Kato, who was seen skulking around this neighborhood. He is my lawful property. Moses, it is an outrage! Yes. The British promised him his freedom when he escaped to join their army. Now that they've lost the war, the moment my brother's found, he'll be returned to slavery. If he's still alive. Either way, my friend, I will never see Cato again. Oh, that was close. Oh, they wouldn't let me go. Everyone wanted to talk to me. And why was that, Henri? They all wanted to know what it's like to be the son of the great Lafayette. Oh. Later, later. The Marquis wishes some privacy. Shoo, shoo. Oh. That's it. Merci. Au revoir. Well, what's to eat? Henri. It's all right, mon ami. Tell me, what will you do now? Will you continue with Dr. Franklin's Gazette? No, Marquis. I have other plans. I've been blessed with learning. Many others have not. I would like to share my blessing with as many of them as I can. I plan to start a school for Negro children. Boys and girls, both. And you, Marquis? I will visit General Washington at Mount Vernon. Then I shall return to France. There I will build support for the United States and work to abolish slavery in France's colonies. I shall miss all of you very, very much. Henri? Not as much, I'm afraid, as Henri will miss you. You're throwing me in jail because I can't pay my debts? I borrow that money I owe because the government asked me to, so I could buy more grain to grow more food for our army and the French army. Ah! Take your hands off me, sir. And now that there's no more soldiers to feed, I can't sell my produce. And instead of helping me who helped you, you make me sell my farm to pay my debts. Oh, that's not oh, no. And when the money from the sale doesn't cover my debts, you throw me in a cage! Me and darn near every other farmer in Massachusetts! We were soldiers! We risked our lives fighting for... your freedom! This is not Rich. justice! We fought Let for this go. country! Oh, Give us back our farms! Order! Order! Let him go! We won't stand for this! These, James, are what you describe as the fruits of the Continental Soldier's courage. Let me go! It's not fair! I fought for you! What's happened to New York is tragic. Please be all right, Mrs. Radcliffe. Be all right. Mrs. Radcliffe, I'm so glad you're safe. Yes, well, I am alive. I'm grateful for that, I suppose. Perhaps Nova Scotia won't be all that bad. You're going to Canada? Come, Sarah. Let us go where we can have privacy, for a few minutes anyway. Take a look, my dear, while you still can. They're taking my house, the Americans. And I had to sell my jewelry to pay for the war, they said.
just as I'm selling everything else before I journey to Canada. All I wanted to do was live my life in peace as a loyal British subject. Oh, Mrs. Radcliffe. Oh, Sarah. The horror of it all. Who's there? Is anyone there? Yes, Moses. Cato! Sit down, Cato. You'll be safe here. I doubt anyone will be looking in here, but I want to be sure. This is Ben Franklin's laboratory? It is. Cato, I searched for you. How did you get here? Where have you been? My brother, I've been everywhere. Tell me. I saw you at Yorktown when the British forced you out into no man's land. Moses, an amazing thing happened to me at Yorktown. General Clinton, we no longer have enough food or water to sustain all our men. I'm afraid our Negro soldiers will have to fend for themselves. No! It's too dangerous! Do not send them out of the fortifications! We risk our lives for the British! You promised us our freedom! Come here! Here! Come! I'm going to help you! I'll hide you! Hurry! Trust me! Since then, more white people have helped me remain free. They're not all bad. Moses, I can't explain it, but knowing that, it's like a weight's been lifted off my soul. It's only me. It's a petition, William. It asks the state of Massachusetts to stop selling our farms and throwing us in prison for debt. To show some appreciation and understanding of what we sacrificed to help win the war. Enough of us sign this thing. Maybe the government will start to listen to us. This is amazing, Daniel. It's democracy in action. Yes, James. This is what I fought for in General Washington's army. I'm not surprised by my poor treatment at the hands of the Americans. I am, however, shocked at the wretched behavior of my own mother, England. What has England done? Very little. They've given us a few shillings. Would you like to see what else they've given us? I would. Open those boxes behind me. A hat? Heavy clothes for the horrible Nova Scotia climate. Open the other one. What's this? It's called a pitchfork. There are other farm supplies, too. Tell me, Sarah, what is a woman like me going to do with farm supplies? I... I... While you have a pencil, 
Do write King George a thank you note from me. Some black people are even going back to Africa. It's hard enough to get you across the street without getting caught, much less all the way to Africa. More going up to Nova Scotia. Lots of British, too. That letter from Sarah, her friend. Hurry! And the state's answer to our honest petition is silence. Or just about. This won't stand! We must act! If the courts mean to take away our farms and throw us in jail, maybe we have to close down the courts any way we can. We'll take our freedom down with the courts! We'll fight if we have to! Wait! Wait a minute, everyone! Fighting your own government? Has it really come to that? I'm afraid it has, James. We owe it to ourselves. And yes, we owe it to our country! Yeah! Oh, 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 oh. We're almost to New York City. Come on out. Remember, my papers prove I'm a free man. If anyone questions us, do as I do. Act confident. Brother, I'll act like a rooster if that's what it takes to be free. Yeah! I found you! <laughs> Wait, come back! Oh! But Sarah, I don't even know this man! Mrs. Radcliffe, he's a farmer! He'll help you survive in Canada. All you have to do is hide him on your way up there. Ma'am, my brother will clear you the finest farm in Nova Scotia. How do I know he won't disappear the moment we reach Canada? Because he says he won't. He's my brother, and I promise he... Excuse me. Ma'am, powers beyond our control are forcing both of us to start our lives all over. I'd like to help you start your new life, if you'll help me start mine. It was easier saying goodbye this time. Why is that? Because this time, he's going off to freedom. Henri, stop! Henri, I hope you are in here and can hear me. It caused me great pain to say goodbye to George Washington. I do not want you to feel that kind of pain. I want to take you to France. You can live with me there and help me tell the world of this amazing new thing called Liberty. I am here! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for chasing me! Apples? Get your apples here! Clean streets, merchants, new homes. Newspapers! Newspapers! And look at all these newspapers. Here you go. Children, New York City is coming back strong. I've been thinking. Maybe I could run my own newspaper someday. I could help keep our government honest. Like your article about the Massachusetts farmers. Maybe it will urge the government to help them before there's any violence. Defending freedom of the press is a fine goal, James. The fight for freedom never ends. Sarah, could I borrow some money to buy a newspaper? But Moses just bought one. 
No, I mean to buy a newspaper. <laughs> oh, James. Dr. Franklin, good to have you back home. <laughs> Dr. Franklin, I don't think I've ever seen a more joyous day. My dear, I believe you're right. back in 35. I'm told it's the oldest complete house in all the Berkshires. It was in this house that we drafted our statement of grievances against English rule. Unfortunately, you can see how much attention King George paid to it. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. You're welcome, ma'am. Betty, come here. What is the meaning of this? What, madam? What, you say? Look, dust on my Wedgwood vase. I'll fix it right away, madam. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Bless you, missus. Choo! <clears throat> Mrs. Adams, I'm delighted you could come. I do hope we will see your John back from Europe soon, too. If the news from Yorktown is good, Colonel Ashley, perhaps John and Dr. Franklin will rejoin us soon and bring along a peace treaty with them. It is my dearest hope that that comes to pass. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Adams, uh, I am Theodore Sedgwick. I so admire the contributions you and your husband have made to our new nation. Theodore is the finest attorney in town. You don't want to find yourself on the other side of a case from him. <laughs> Come, friends. Let us begin our meeting with the Declaration of Independence. Good idea. Here, here. Wonderful. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Hi, honey. Did you come to help? That large man from Natick's drinking his ninth cup of punch. Lizzie, quiet. Well, what's more important, us running out of punch and me getting in trouble, or some old words the master's saying? Old words? Huh? Do you know what those old words are about? I don't, Betty, but I have a feeling you're about to tell me. Little sister, those words are about freedom. You and me have been slaves since we were born. What do we know about freedom? Nothing, Lizzie. 
nothing at all. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if someone offered me one minute's freedom and told me I had to die at the end of that minute, I'd take it just to stand one minute on God's earth, a free woman. Dearest mother, so much has happened since I last wrote. General Washington has won at Yorktown. It was truly a miraculous convergence as they're calling it. The French fleet, led by Admiral de Grasse, captured the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> this trapped General Cornwallis. He could get no help or supplies from the sea, and with the town surrounded on all sides by Generals Washington and Rochambeau, he could expect nothing but trouble from the land as well. The siege was terrible, and I feared it might never end. Finally, the lack of food and the endless artillery shelling forced General Cornwallis to concede defeat. Over 7,000 British soldiers surrendered their weapons. Surely with so large a loss, the British will now realize the futility of this war, and we will finally have peace. Andre. Dr. Franklin, wonderful news! Victory at Yorktown! Cornwallis has surrendered! The war is over! This is indeed wonderful news, mon ami. But is the war really over? That, I think, will be up to King George to decide. It is not over! What of our other generals, hmm? Cornwallis is not England! What of Clinton and his 6,000 men? What of our fleet? We are the largest naval force on the ocean, sir, and I'll thank you to remember that. We have defeated these colonists time and again, and we shall do so now. This change is nothing, and I shall write as much to the Secretary of State for America myself, directly. Away with you. I have business to attend to. Dear sir, there will be no peace without honor. Lizzie, more lemonade. I'll get it, madam. I told Lizzie to do it. Lizzie? Right now. What were you eating? Uh, scraps, madam. You ate the family's food without asking me first? Yes, madam. I I'm sorry, madam. You're sorry? Very sorry, madam. E excuse me, madam. Uh... I did not order you to leave. Now clean that up. Uh... And that. And that. Uh... And that. And that! This is fascinating, Mr. Sedgwick. I think I should like to practice law myself someday. With all respect, Sarah, there are no women lawyers. With all respect, Mr. Sedgwick, Perhaps I shall be the first. Perhaps you shall indeed. Excuse me. Betty, 
Come in, please. Thank you, Mr. Sedgwick. Let me take your coat. Now, please, go in and be seated. <laughs> now, Betty, what can I do for you? Sir, I would like you to help me win my freedom for me and my little girl. Oh, excuse me? I don't want to be a slave. And I don't want my girl to grow up as I did, knowing nothing but slavery. Thank you kindly. You're very welcome. Betty, are you asking me to sue Colonel John Ashley, the most important man in this town, for your freedom? Yes, sir. I fear for my child's well-being. You can't let the child be in harm's way, Mr. Sedgwick. But it's more than that, sir. I heard that paper read that all men are born equal and that every man has a right to freedom. I am not a dumb critter. Won't the law give me my freedom? And what, my fellow members of Parliament, did King George Ostrich-like really in plain words say when he got the news of the defeat? He said, our losses in America have been most horrible. The taxes the British people are paying for this war are outrageously high. But even now that Lord Cornwallis has surrendered at Yorktown and our hopes of victory in America have utterly disappeared, I forbid anyone from thinking of peace. My insane rage for revenge lives on, and only the total enslavement of my American subjects will lay it to rest. Gentlemen, what the king speaks is madness, and you, Lord North, must tell him so. Yes. Yes. Betty, why did you come to me? You know I'm a close friend of the colonel's. Master said you're the finest attorney in town, and you were there in Master's study a few years back, writing those other words about freedom everybody was saying. You mean back in 73, when we discussed a Bill of Rights and a Constitution for Massachusetts? Yes, sir. When I was waiting at table, I was keeping still and minding things. I heard you, gentlemen. In all you said, I never heard but that all people are free and equal. I thought long about it and figured I'd see whether I did not come in among them. Sir, you must help. Has a slave ever won her freedom in court before? Yes, sir. A number of times. But those cases were always based on a master promising freedom to his slave and then breaking that promise. Colonel Ashley made no such promise to Betty. So you won't take Betty's case? On the contrary, that's exactly why I will take Betty's case. Yahoo! Ahem. I do not care what that vile Mr. Charles Fox says in Parliament. I do not care what anyone says in Parliament. Lord North, I do not care what anyone says in the entire world. I shall quit my throne before I shall break apart this British Empire which I love and serve. I shall never surrender to those American rebels. Never! This is a great opportunity for us. Let's hope they free the poor woman. Can Mumbet win, Mrs. Adams? She has fine lawyers in Mr. Sedgwick and Mr. Tapping Weave. And she has right on her side. <clears throat> yes, Sarah. We shall see whether those two weapons are strong enough to carry the day. Is that the jury? It is. But all the jurors are men, and they're all white. How will Mumbet get a fair trial? Give them some credit, Sarah. Perhaps they'll understand we are all the same race, the human race. Judge, 
On behalf of Colonel Ashley, who has served his state and country so well in so many ways, we ask that this case be dismissed immediately. What? No. Will they do that? And that Bet be returned to her lawful residence, the home of Colonel Ashley. Absolutely not. Order! On what grounds, sir? Judge, the custom of our nation considers slavery to be right and correct. Bet is the lawful Negro slave of John Ashley. Colonel Ashley can testify to that. It is a simple question of ownership, you see. Therefore, we ask you to return Bet to Colonel Ashley immediately. Oh, that's outrageous! Good justice will be done! Your Highness! Now, my cowardly Premier, Lord North, has sent me his resignation. They are all against me, but I shall not accept this. And I shall not let my colonies go. The British Empire, like these hounds, is strong. The rebels, like the fox, are weak. Majesty, I'm afraid sometimes the fox does escape the hound. The court rejects Colonel Lashley's motion to dismiss this case. Mr. Sedgwick, you may speak for your client. Thank you, Judge. In the past, a slave in Massachusetts has been freed only when a master went back on a promise to free that slave. But we would like to make two different arguments. Two new arguments. First, no Massachusetts law has ever established slavery as legal. I defy Colonel Ashley to show me one that does. Second, even more importantly, even if such a law did exist, it would be canceled out by our state's new constitution. As my client has so wisely pointed out to me, our Massachusetts constitution states, all men are born free and equal and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights, among which may be reckoned the right of enjoying their liberties. Gentlemen, Betty cannot be the lawful slave of Colonel John Ashley for a very simple reason. Slavery is unlawful. <laughs> it's just a scrape, Catherine. You're gonna be fine. You ready to catch your brother now? Betty? Yes, Sarah? What will you do if you lose? Honey, my husband, rest in peace, died in this war so we all could be free from your friends back in England. Not so some of us could be slaves to some others of us. Somehow, sometime, me and Lil' Bet are gonna be free, and you can count on that. Betty, Sarah, the jury's coming back. <sighs> Gentlemen, have you reached a decision? We have, Judge. We find that Bet is not now, nor has she ever been, the legal servant or property of John Ashley. We award 30 shillings in damages to Bet and order John Ashley to pay her for all her service since she was 21 years old. We also declare that John Ashley shall pay all court costs. Congratulations to us all. This is a great day. Isn't it wonderful? All our people shall be free. <laughs> you got him, Catherine. Good going. Friends, friends, to courage, to freedom, to mum bet. To mum bet! Hooray! Hooray! I've given myself a new name, a free name. From this moment on, I'm Elizabeth Freeman. Elizabeth Freeman! Hooray! Betty, 
I'm hoping you'll come back and work for me. For salary, of course. We sure could use you back. Thank you, mister. But I'm gonna stay here with the Sedgwicks. They've done nothing but treat me right. And with ten children and Mrs. Sedgwick ill, somebody's got to do the cooking. <laughs> I'll leave you to it, then. Goodbye, Betty. Girls, it sure feels good to call that man Mr. instead of Master. You're free, baby. Just like I always promised. You're free. My good friends, King George has come to his senses. He wishes to negotiate peace with France and with the new United States of America. to make that announcement again. <laughs> and mother, there's more good news. Another slave by the name of Cork Walker sued for his freedom in the Supreme Court of Massachusetts and also won. The decision will surely lead to slavery being outlawed in Massachusetts. Listen to what the Chief Justice said. Slavery took its origin from European nations and the British government. But a different idea has taken place here in America. Everyone is born free and equal. Everyone is entitled to liberty and to have it guarded. Slavery is in my judgment as effectively abolished as it can be. Thank you, Mr. Ashley. Mother. These long overdue decisions for liberty give me new hope for my new country. Our new country. I hope and trust that the horror of slavery will soon be abolished in the rest of our 13 states. Forever. For mother, if one American is not free, none of us are. <laughs> <laughs>